for this final session. We'll go on to 6.15, but we have lots to think about and lots to talk about. So if you could sit down, including Millbanks, Nemensieplatz. <laughs> um, Okay, so the, the way my name is Janet Soskis, and I'm chairing this last <laughs> uh, chairing this last session. And I've I've been uh, suggested that I would ask each speaker in turn to uh, say a few words of, of comment on this afternoon or or the the whole thing, and then we'll go on to open questions. So I'll start with Professor Hosler, please. Well, thank you very much. I want to uh, react to the uh, extraordinary lecture uh, of my friend David Bentley Hart, uh, uh, which was not only uh, stylistically brilliant, but also um, uh, both enormously erudite and uh, philosophically um, uh, profound. Uh, I completely agree with uh, uh, two things that he said and that I think are important for our discussions. First of all, the Hegelian philosophy is the most anti-gnostic philosophy that ever existed. It it's simply absurd to compare Hegel with Gnosticism. It's often based on the idea that Hegel is a rationalist, which means he wants to understand faith, and this is connected with the name of Gnosis. But of course, the act Gnosis in the Gnostic movements, um, uh, in uh, a contrast to Pistis, is more an intuitive act and not an argumentative act. So even the concept of Gnosis is quite different. But the content of the philosophy is, as David um, uh, pointed out very well, absolutely different. Uh, Gnosticism is a radically dualistic philosophy, and Hegel's philosophy is one of the most anti-dualistic philosophies that ever existed. So it's very difficult to see how you can put any continuity between Gnosticism and Hegel. I think that in the 20th century, one of the great researchers on Gnosticism was Hans Jonas, and he was much, much uh, better um, positioned in connecting some aspects of Gnosticism with the Heideggerian feeling of Geworfenheit uh, than uh, Neander um, was in connecting uh, Gnosticism uh, with Hegel. So there is complete agreement with that. Another point that I found fascinating in David's explanation was his insistence on what happens in the fourth century, um, uh, uh, something new. Um, uh, happens uh, uh, with regard to the understanding of the relation of the father and the son. And the supernationalist model, he doesn't have difficulties to use the term, nor do have I, um, that we had earlier, um, is given up. And you can relate in different ways to this historical process that in my eyes is undoubtable because it's very difficult to deny that Jesus was a supernationalist. Uh, I think Jesus, the historical Jesus would have been quite surprised um, uh, at the Crete um, uh, um, um, of Nicaea and Constantinople. Um, uh, even First of all, the Christologies of the four different Gospels are quite different one from the other. Um, and even um, the Christology of uh, the offer of a Gospel according to John uh, is subordination as the Father is greater uh, than um, the Son. Uh, at the same time, as a good Hegelian, I try to explain why this uh, uh, process that took place in the fourth century um, is a fascinating process. And uh, in one of the many parts of my paper that I had to skip, I quote from um, De Trinitate 15, 19, 36, um, in which Augustine writes, there is not there the stipulation of that which is given and the domination of those who give, but a harmony of that which is given and those who give, which fits very well with uh, Catherine's um, lecture, uh, what we just heard. So there is a philosophical insight in the superiority of symmetric relations compared to asymmetric relations that drives the new concept of a trinity. And I have no difficulties to say as a good Hegelian, this was um, um, a progress in the development um, of uh, um, uh, the human mind, of ethics, um, uh, and uh, uh, that therefore this change um, uh, has profound intrinsic value, even if it was a break with an earlier um, uh, tradition. I don't think uh, we can deny that there has been uh, this break, as David uh, uh, pointed out. But we can say, even if it was a break, um, it was um, a progress. And this is connected, and now I finish, uh, to my general starting point uh, that it's very difficult to justify um, central tenets of Christianity in a historical way, because, of course, 
the various sources of Christianity are not all logically compatible with each other. They have different points of view. But if you have the idea, which is forcefully articulated, of course, in the Gospel according to John and the doctrine of a paraclete, that there is a development of the spirit that goes beyond Jesus himself, as uh, Jesus is um, uh, uh, says in the Gospel according to John, then you can say we have had a development to new ideas uh, that prove uh, um, philosophically um, uh, very um, uh, powerful, and therefore we shouldn't worry too much about the fact that this change occurred in the fourth century. Would you like to come in with you? You, you no. don't have to comment on his. But you no, uh, it, it just uh, uh, if I were to comment on it, we, we would just turn it into a conversation between the two of us, which is precisely what I intend to do. You may. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, a, just a few qualifications, though. I mean, it, 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 there is a development, but it's a development also the, the, of, of uh, aspects of the faith that are there also already uh, in, in scripture and tradition, yeah. It's hard to say uh, with, uh, uh, the, taking it as given that perhaps the synoptics give us a better historical picture of Jesus than John, obviously, but nonetheless, there are aspects, say, even of Matthew that suggest that there, that there, there is a mystery teaching of Christ, or at least many good, great New Testament scholars have seen it that, that has Johannine resonances. And what's interesting about the Gospel of John is there you have both uh, the word presented as distinct from the Father in a way that would have been very traditional uh, for late antiquity for an understanding of, of, a, of a continuum of divine hypostases uh, leading all the way from right down to creation. In, just in the first verse, there's a distinction, say, between uh, the, the Father's otheos in, in the most proper sense, and the Son seems to be, in, unless the form without, uh, without the definite article is a result of it being a predicate, but then there's syntactical problems. Nonetheless, seems that there's a clear subordination there, too, or a clear distinction. And yet that seems to inaugurate what then becomes an unfolding pattern in which ever bolder statements are made about the one sees the Father sees me until finally after the resurrection there's the culminating declaration of in chapter 20, O Kyrios mou keo theos mou, my Lord, O Kyrios, you know, Adonai, ke o theos, God in the proper sense, my God, so uh, it's not as if the development is simply a break. That's not how I put it. it, it it's, a, it's an understanding that, that from a very early period, reflection on Christ, especially in the Johannine vein in which the eternal nature of Christ is being reflected upon rather than uh, from history upward, it's from eternity downward. And the two have always been understood as in some sense inseparable in the formation of Christian understanding that already those resources are there. And that's why the great conflict of the fourth century occurred, because already it was understood. There were also soteriological issues, but already it was understood that there were those who followed the pattern of the Alexandrian tradition, like Arius, but, but others who thought that there was a clear declaration of something like, or in fact, co-equality. So that's the, I would just qualify as a historical narrative. It's not just a break. Mm -hmm. it is, um, so. Thank you. Uh, Isabel, can I go over to you? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a difficult task because uh, I'm going to speak about, uh, about Michael Chute's uh, paper. Does not disqualify the other ones, of course. I'm sorry. Uh, it's a difficult task to speak about like this. Uh, what I um, really was uh, uh, very astonished in the, um, Michael Chute's paper was his insistence upon the fact that the difference should be serious, the notion of serious difference, uh, which I think can be related to what I tried to say when we, I said that we need a concept of affirmative difference and not negative, only purely negative difference. We are very bold, actually, because we are trying with our human nature to speak about the Trinity. Uh, I mean, it's extremely complicated, we cannot. But 
since we have been created to try to return to God and understand God in some way, we need to think within our categories. And I think that the necessity of the affirmative, the, the, the affirmative dimension of difference is extremely important. Unfortunately, we are coming after Thomas Aquinas. And so it's extremely complicated to go beyond uh, the, the Aquinas um, Trinitarian ontology, which is, uh, I, pre I have to say, it's absolutely marvelous. But if we want to, I'm sorry, if we want to try to go a little beyond the uh, Trinitarian ontology or maybe trying to find uh, a way, uh, I, I tried with the notion of beauty, being as beautiful. So it's another way of seeing being than substance. We need new tools to, to, to try to have this, uh, to, to try to find something. And so that's why I use the notion of qualitative difference, which can help to understand um, being as beautiful. But I was very much interested, so you're here actually. I was very much interested that, uh, of the idea of the serious, the affirmative, the serious dimension of the difference. Because as long as we think the difference of pure negativity or indetermination, we have to face a lot of consequences. One of them you, 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 you said, uh, you spoke about it. Um, another one is also to consider uh, only, well, I'm not saying that the death of Christ is not important, but we tend to insist upon the death of Christ, whereas the incarnation is from the beginning to resurrection. And I think what Thomas Aquinas is doing very well is to show us, of course, the importance of the death of Christ, of course, and the passion, but also the life, the events of the life of Christ from is virgin birth to the resurrection. And if you have a good uh, dimension of the affirmative, uh, I'm sorry, I'm French, it's difficult to speak, a uh, notion of affirmative dimension of the difference, then you don't have to resolve all Christ into the specific negative moment of death. Okay, I don't want to be a heretic. I'm not saying that it's not important. But you see, you have a, a better view, I think, of incarnation as a total unity. Thank you. Graham. I'm, I'd like to do two things, right? And, and one of them is to pick up <coughs> something from uh, Catherine's not Catherine's paper, but actually your comment, Catherine, afterwards about the situation at the Duma at the present, which actually, in many ways, took me right back to um, John's opening remarks about Cominius and w where, where we are, what, what is the world in which we are actually living. So I want to say something about that, and I also want to say something as being probably one of the few people here who actually have been... This is a series of conferences that's gone over now for over 20 years um, that began in Peterhouse with a colloquium that ended up with the volume uh, uh, that was, uh, became Radical Orthodoxy. And uh, there have been conferences every so often that have always had students actually organising them, which has been absolutely wonderful. But they've all had a very kind of distinctive um, aspect to those conferences. And a number of people have come back to them every year, a number of friendships have formed, because in many ways they brought together, and they still, when I was coming to this one, I still feel the, 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 the same kind of resonance. It brought together a kind of friendship, an embracing friendship. And that, that could be ecumenical. It didn't, it's not intentionally ecumenical, but it brings in ecumenical. It crosses over clerical and, and lay. It crosses over academic and people who are not necessarily being paid for the work they do within the academy. It, and it has that very broad aspect, and it's, it's maintained that, and it's been really good to see the way it's maintained that. But it's maintained that, I think, because 
it is one of the few places, or the, the, in the theological world, we're looking out and shouting out for theological imagination. Uh, there's all sorts of things that can be said. There's all sorts of books that can be read. But, but in fact, what we're looking for is that kind of vision, a theological vision, a theological imagination, which can actually move us into a different kind of space, a different kind. And I, I felt that, coming back to Catherine's paper, it was, you know, here is the vision, and there is the reality of the Dumo and the security guards. And, and it's not, it, it's the way in which um, the vision does not stop being the vision. The, the, the theological imagination sustains the possibility for saying this should not be. <coughs> and that then becomes the way in which the theological imagination is not just let's zip up into another dimension and forget everything. It's actually always bringing us back to, so how do we, how do we live and how do we change because we live and change within the Trinity? How do we do that in a way that actually is lived out in the realities where, in fact, you have to go through a security system to actually reach the baptistry and the sacrament uh, within the Duma. So I thought that was a beautiful picture, Catherine, of where we are, but it also is emphasizing what this to me is about, which is trying to transfigure and energize the theological imagination. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I was very struck the way the last session, and particularly um, our two women speakers, brought the body center into the discussion. Uh, and I, I like that very much. The physicality, uh, this can't be, and this relates perhaps some of the things you've just said to Graham, that, uh, that we, we're talking all the time in abstractions, and it's very important. We know how vital that is to have good metaphysics and good theology, but that doesn't preclude the fact that we are bodies in spaces and we walk through doors. And I thought that was quite interesting that and quite nice that it should culminate in those papers, whether Ryan had planned it so or not. And anyway, we've got some time for conversation. We're going on to quarter past, so uh, we've got several things on the table. We've got the Hegeonism, we've got beauty, we've got questions of Aquinas and Kant, and, and indeed questions of, of where we should go with theology and the imagination and theological presence in uh, a vexed and vexatious world. So um, if you would like to raise your hands. Oh, yep, sorry. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, this is quite a general question. Um, I don't want to criticize the conference because I think it's been really well organized. Um, as an undergraduate, um, some of it is beyond my understanding, um, but it's still been interesting to be a part of, and I've definitely take, taken some great things away from it. Um, my question is about the gender imbalance here. Um, and also on the reading list, um, I did notice, um, I think there were six female speakers um, and considerably more male speakers. Um, and definitely that's also seen in the, uh, you know, the amount of women to men in the audience. Um, and yeah, the reading list was basically male dominated. Um, I know that Catherine Tanner has written on the Trinity and Sarah Coakley has written on the Trinity. Um, I feel as though um, maybe something has been missed by not looking more at a female perspective. Um, I mean, obviously, women aren't the only people who can view, you know, the feminine in God, the feminine in the spirit, um, female connections, especially in something... Um, that seems so, you know, female, male. Um, so yeah, my question is just, do you feel as though something has been missing? Um, do you think that's something we could work on going forward? Um, if this was to take place again, um, have more female perspectives and hopefully encourage more women to come and join in the conversation. Graham. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha! 
that, that, that comes from um, a concern coming out of the materiality that, in fact, it's not just a materiality, it, it, the, the, there is a gendering of that materiality. And it's not just for me, uh, I mean, if the way forward would not just be for me that, in fact, there were more women. I'd like to see a greater racial uh, distribution as well. And it, some, of the, some of the topics of the conversation that have come up have been very much wanting to uh, n not divorce a kind of Christianity, supersessionist Christianity from a Jewish heritage. So I would love to actually have more engagement with other religions uh, as well, uh, and particularly religions within the monotheistic traditions with, with Islam too. So I think actually th there is a diversification uh, th th that's needed. But we know this throughout the whole of the academy, though, that there is a greater need for equality and diversity across uh, the academy. Um, I, I, I am encouraged by the way in which um, equality and diversity is now on everybody's agenda within the university. And things like the Athena Swan have actually pushed that high up the uh, agenda. It's a work in progress, but, but if in fact we were not trying to aim towards, and, and I don't know who it is there, I don't know, because I'm not part of anything in this kind of way, but if we as a theological community were not actually trying in our theological imagination to embrace a thousand differences in their different kind of ways in which they're good, then, then in, in fact we have not failed to capture something of the nature of the vision that we're speaking about. Please raise your hands high. I see a question back there. It's a bit difficult to see you against the light here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I'm going to try not to do too much with this question because uh, it might be a little bit wide ranging. But we've referred a couple times to Karen Kilby's distinction you know, between thinking about and thinking in. And uh, I know that Karen Kilby does not much care for um, von Balthasar. But um, I couldn't help but think, um, you know, as Dr. Hart was speaking of, you know, the sort of elevation of Christ up into the eternal life of the Trinity, what that ensures most fundamentally, like the significance of the Trinity in that scheme is that, you know, it gives access to God, right? I mean, that's, that's what it's about. And the same thing for the divinity of the Spirit, right? How if the Spirit actualizes our knowledge of God, that's what's being safeguarded. Um, except, you know, how do we come to knowledge of God? And then von Balthasar speaks often of, you know, the, the form of Christ being, you know, the light through which divinity shines. And so then you can attend to, to Christ's life. And I guess I was just wondering if the ultimate problem that we've been discussing, like where if Trinity becomes abstraction, is that Christ's life can then have, no, doesn't have any more relevatory meaning such that in the Hegelian scheme, at least as Dr. Hart has described it, right, it just becomes completely misread. Um, and so I guess I was wondering, is like, should we not be talking more about if we want to know something about the Trinity, should we not be talking more about the cruciform life and the shape of that life? Um. <coughs> David, would you like to try? Try, um, yeah. Well, um, you see, I, 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 don't, I don't have any <coughs> objection to uh, talking uh, about, about these matters in all modalities, the speculative as well as the narrative, the doctrinal, as, 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 as well as the philosophical. Um, it, it, I mean, I, I, temperamentally, I, I find Balthazar uh, somewhat difficult to swallow quite often on, on, on precisely this issue just because of how he goes about it. But obviously, uh, <laughs> the difference uh, between approaching uh, the Trinity as a truth of reason uh, that is, the sort of vague thought you can have about the nature of the relationship between being and knowledge and how that is consummated in the satiety of a sort of, say, a spiritual delight and intellectual feasting uh, is uh, a, a fairly empty kind of knowledge if it's, if it's not one that is uh, characterized by only those things that are revealed for Christians in Christ, such as that the nature of this life is one of abundant self-outpouring love, 
uh, the, the relation to that love is the one salvific truth of history, you know, things like that. So, of course, but I don't know, was there some sort of deficiency of that kind of talk to your mind in, in the way this conference unfolded? I spent a great deal of the time with Janet's dog, so I, I missed some of the papers. Uh, <laughs> um, um. Yeah, I guess um, I don't want to go on for too long. I wasn't thinking about maybe von Balthasar's more controversial things about Christ's suffering so much just as, you know, what Christ's life says about, you know, God's love and sort of constancy. Um, well, can I say this? Yeah. I mean, it is interesting since we're talking about the, 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 uh, the controversies of the fourth century, the Trinitarian, and I agree entirely with Vittorio, there is a great uh, movement forward in the development of Christian thought, Christian philosophy, Christian metaphysics, but not... But it's inadvertent. It unfolds. What were the actual concerns of the council, aside from making the emperor happy that there was now <laughs> some kind of consensus in this religion he had inherited, only to discover that it was a physiparous group of very loud people? You know. Well, what actually won the day, if you look at, the, at, at, at what we can reconstruct of the reasoning, is, is a deep soteriological concern. Right? How had Christians always worshipped and prayed? And what was it they presumed had happened, which was that they had been united directly to God in Christ. But there's a problem here, obviously, how remote, we, because of course you take the old Alexandrian model, Christ as the Corypheus of the heavenly places, the angel of mighty counsel, the, the high priest of the, who, who is the, the ambassador of the unseen father, but who himself, if, if, what, if, if the... Uh, if what we get from both Arius and the Eunomians is true, who himself has only a limited access to the Father, only a limited knowledge, not even a real insight. So obviously the question of how the Son could be that immediate knowledge of God that transforms us, according, which is the salvation, the soteriological expectation of the time, requires that the, the Son be adequate to the Father. But then again, how are we joined to the Son, you know, in sanctification, in sacrament, in the corporate life of the, of, uh, the interpersonal, the communal, the created life that is, that is the life of the Spirit. And again, so the Spirit must join us to the Son, that the Son might join us to the Father. It must be adequate to the Son. So we see that it's all unfolding from, from, immediate, from religious, from dogmatic, from soteriological concerns, the, the, the philosophical... Uh, the philosophical consequences of that are entirely unexpected at that point. It's not a series of metaphysical questions. It's a question, something has happened, uh, an apocalyptic interruption of history and, ex uh, and expectation that has transformed us according to our beliefs, our prayers, the way we live, uh, and trying to articulate it then leads inevitably to an ever deeper speculative and rational appropriation of that as a metaphysics. And so the two can't be separated from, from just as a de facto reality of, of, of the history of the faith, but also because, uh, not just because Christ is the real presence of God, but in just a broader, more general sense, the order of knowing is always the inverse of the order of being. We always ascend to the truth uh, from the most immediate encounter of, of, of the particular as embraced within, within a, a knowledge that, that following this on with an intention, a true desire to understand what it reveals about the structure of reality can carry us as far as the very presence of God. So I don't know if that was uh, helpful or if it just sounded good to me. Uh, <laughs> we have I thought it was very good, thank you. So if we could have a mic right down at the front, please. Um, Thanks. Um, I have a question, uh, not only about the, the last panel, but the conference in general. Uh, because uh, during all the conference, uh, I was thinking about the place of the philosophers in a, such a conference. Because if I understood, we were three philosophers, something like that. We all came from France, probably because of the context in France. Uh, but many people spoke about philosophy too. So you don't have to be a philosopher to speak about philosophy. And when you are a theologian, you can speak about philosophy. It's not sure that when you are a philosopher, you can speak about theology. The first, the first question is, 
are we on the same field or not? And how is it possible, for example, for a philosopher to speak about Trinity, what many French philosophers are doing now, for example? And in the title, New Trinitarian Ontology, it is clear that Trinity is um, a theological experience, a theological dogma, but ontology, it is a philosophical concept. So, in the title, there is an attempt to link philosophy and theology. It's not a, an option. You can't, you can't, we have to do that. And to renew theology, as in all the history of theology too, you need philosophy. So the question is, which philosophy do you need? Not for philosophy itself, but for theology. Because the title is New Trinitarian Ontologies. So my question is, how all the Trinitarian ontologies we developed are new? And how is it possible that they can be new? And for they can be new, how is it possible to discuss, to really discuss between philosophy and theology? Not for philosophers give lessons to theologians, not for theologians said we don't need philosophy, but to try, all of us, you can be a philosopher. I, I convince that you can be a philosopher and speak about Trinity. Also as a philosopher, because it, is, it can be an object for philosophy, and many philosophers did it. And it is an object for theology. So my question is, how, how is it possible to, to link Trinity and ontology, it means theology and philosophy, to produce new Trinitarian ontologies, which is what, what we have to do. Could I, could I just uh, ask, clearly theology has always used philosophy, and theology has not always accepted the way philosophers have done philosophy, the big difference. Um, but are you asking, is there a way in which theology can play a part in contributing to the philosophical discovery of the recovery of ontology? Yes. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, I think it's a very important question, and uh, um, I'm very grateful that it is posed. I mean, as you just were saying, uh, you cannot do theology without philosophy because every theologian uses categories, um, and the clarification of basic categories is the job of philosophy. Um, Ernst Jüngel, in his famous book, uh, God as Geheimnis der Welt, hate uh, attacks the mix of philosophy or theology. Um, but of course, when he uses categories like God is, more, God is more than necessary, he uses a modal category, and I would like to know what that means. And we have a relatively powerful modal logic in which modal concepts have been clarifi clarified. And uh, so uh, I would like to know whether this fits with the meaning of these terms. And if he says, I have a different meaning of necessity than you philosophers have, fine with me, but I would like then to know what follows from this meaning. What are the entailments of the use of this specific concept of necessity. So it seems inevitable to me that theologians use philosophical categories. And there was a very, very strong awareness of that in the tradition. Ryugena, for example, uses the term philosophia and theologia interchangeably. They are the same thing for them. And of course, the term theologia was a creation of a philosopher. Plato creates the terms of theologia. And uh, uh, to a large amount, what has happened in the Catholic theology was that the Thomas solution that occurred in the 13th century uh, that distinguishes the preambula de articulos fidei from the articuli fidei became canonic. And people said, well, there is a part of theology, fundamental theology, that is ultimately philosophically rational. And then there are specific Christian tenets that we add to that. Now, there are a lot of problems with Thomas' solution, and we don't want to enter into that. But what is clear is that Thomas' solution is an invention or creation or discovery of the 13th century. It is absurd to project it back to earlier philosophers. Augustine does not have this model. Richard of St. Victor in the 12th century does not have this model. Um, Ramon Lull, a little bit later when Aquinas does not have this model, and Cusa explicitly argues against this model. So there have been a lot of Christian theologians who thought that we have to find rational arguments also for Trinity and Incarnation. Of course, 
in the process of developing these arguments, we change in a subtle way the uh, contents of certain dogmas. We reinterpret them in a different way. Um, and that is one of the reasons why if a church bases its claims on the authority of the institution, the Thomas model is relatively attractive. Uh, these are things about which philosophers are not allowed to speak um, so that we can keep them um, stably and we repeat them without really understanding um, uh, what they mean. And I think that is the danger. Now, of course, one reason why theologians are sometimes afraid of philosophy is the fact that there are a lot of philosophies. And the big question is, which philosophies should one take? Well, of course, as a philosopher, I can only say, take the true philosophy. Um, and of course, this then leads to the question, but how do you know what the true philosophy is? And my position is that there are philosophical arguments for a certain type of philosophy, and that this type of philosophy is indeed the only reasonable basis for a theology that wants to understand itself. And what are the basic ideas of this type of philosophy? As I said in my paper, Augustine has a very, very clear triadic ontological ordering. He insists that the mind is irreducible to matter. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he teaches this with very new arguments that really nobody understood till the 17th century. I don't want to discuss the question whether Descartes copied a lot from Augustine or not. I think he's not completely ingenuous when he tells us that he looked the now up passages on the, uh, in De Trinitate and found out that there are some convergences, but that in fact uh, his ideas are quite different. I think he was much more influenced by Augustine than he gives us to know. But clearly, the medieval philosophers did not really understand that argument because they have the Aristotelian model of the mind as a function of an organic body, um, and they do not develop the radical difference between first person and third person perspective, which is Augustine's discovery. So I do think that a dualistic philosophy that says the mental is not identical with physical is the right philosophy. They are very good analytical philosoph uh, philosophers like Kripke who have made forceful arguments in favor of that, and it is the only basis of any rational belief in the immortality of the soul. Um, therefore, we should endorse this aspect. And the third realm of being that Augustine recognizes is the ideal realm, which ultimately identifies with God, because our mind is temporal, but it refers to something that is not temporal. And so, a system of philosophy that recognizes with three branches of being and tries to understand their cooperation and their unity seems to me the basic Trinitarian ontology that we need because on one hand it's triadic, so it has something of Trinity, but it's also the basis of making philosophical sense of the world and of the Christian tradition. So become all objective idealists. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes, fascinated by by the last answer, and I, I wanted to follow up on that. I, I wanted, I mean, uh, what if we take seriously uh, what you said that uh, in the early Christianity, up until a bit before the fourth century, uh, people did not uh, make a difference between philosophy and theology. For example, Origen's project seems to be, uh, I mean, he, a kind of Christian philosophy, whereas we think it's theology. But if we take that seriously, and, and uh, Origen's legacy, I mean, it's clear that the, uh, what happens there is not just rational argument. It's much t richer than that. It's also hermeneutical. Uh, first of all, hermeneutical. Um, e everything is based on how we read <coughs> It is performative and liturgical in a way, and it's also transformative. Mm -hmm. So there is a much richer notion of philosophy or theology there, which maybe uh, wor is, is worth uh, reflecting upon. Mm -hmm. Isabel? I'm sorry. I think we should be cautious about the definition of philosophy too, to go not, not on your ground, but uh, to answer your question. Uh, because the notion of philosophy has evolved uh, during uh, in antiquity, it was, as Pierre Hardot has clearly demonstrated, a way of life. So, I mean, the, the notion of philosophy has changed during, uh, from antiquity to the Middle Ages, certainly because of Christianism. But uh, when the, the pagans are doing philosophy, and of course um, they had 
well, they are they are they have not the, they are not the winner of the history. I mean, the Neoplatonism <laughs> failed, pagan, pagan failed, uh, considering the creation. But when they are speaking of philosophy, it was how to eat, what shall we do? Uh, there was a lot of um, prayers and everything. So the very name of philosophy has extremely under, undergone a tremendous change. Uh, from antiquity to the Middle Ages. And I think it's because of Christianity, we take everything. So when we are speaking of philosophy, especially referring to that period, what are we saying exactly? I think that's really, and when we are speaking of theology, because Aristotle is speaking of the theologique, uh, which is the science of that God possesses, but also the science, the, the, the science about God. So. God, first principle. Uh, so uh, the, the concepts have changed, and I think maybe that's the 1277 crisis that um, it came from the theologian that decided that philosophy should be like that and theology like that. But we have to be careful about the notion, global notion, which is not going against what you were saying. So I think you have the mic back there, yes? Um, hi, I'm Emily, um, and this is a question about saints and theosis. As we talk about philosophy um, and consider the implications of philosophy as a way of life, to use Hedo's phrase, I wonder if the model of thinking Trinitarianly would not take the form of a theologian, but rather that of a saint. So I wonder what the speakers might have to say about that. I think I would want to, I mean, saint isn't like a career status. <laughs> <laughs> Theolo theologians, on the other hand, get roped into being in a career status. Not with that I kind of I, attitude. I, I, <laughs> yeah, what did you think? <laughs> to me, it... it if you're doing the, the if you're if you actually are trying to do theology in a praxis way, in in a way in which you're living uh, the Trinity, that will have that's about formation, that's about pedagogy of grace, that's about sanctification. I, I don't know if if sanctification is the movement towards that final being known by Christ as we are known in Christ. Uh, in the Pauline uh, understanding, then in fact, if that's, what we're, if that's the trajectory of sanctification, which I believe it, it is, then in, and then, but whether that's got anything to do with the nature of sainthood, I'm, I'm not sure, but it, it seems to me that there has got to be a, form, a, form, a formativity and a transformativity that's involved in doing theology. And I, it's one of the things that's then really quite difficult when you come up against the question about then, then to what extent can theology, can or should theology be done as something that's within a university system? I think that's still a real question. I've got a, a few questions. Uh, David, would you like to? It's just one thing. I mean, other, other than the obvious thing that if sainthood is required for theology, I have to change careers. But um, just, just quickly, I mean, I, I just want to uh, uh, say that obviously the end of what the whole Christian life is supposed is theosis. I mean, that's that's the. Uh, but but let's defend the very clever, intelligent bastard who can actually contribute to theological knowledge through his or her. Uh, intellect without having the requisite holiness, because there are such creatures, and by the, consider it God's grace that they're able to make that contribution. But theology shouldn't simply be conflated with the life of sanctification, although ideally that's the highest expression of any aspiration of the mind and will towards truth. Okay. There's a question. Uh, yes, okay, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's just a very short comment, but I think it's a little in line with what, <clears throat> what, what we just heard. But, but it seems to me that the patristic writers had an understanding that orthodoxy and orthopraxis, they do, uh, they do go together. That we cannot talk about God without also talking about how God uh, changes us. Uh, 
Um, but, but I have a feeling that the last days we've sort of been trying to set up a framework for how to talk about God as an, as, uh, as an object, so to speak. Um, but, but is it possible to, to do that without also talking about the poor and, uh, and, uh, and the orphan um, and so on? And, and now it ties up to what you were talking about, Graham Ward, talking about where we have the theological uh, imagination. But, but if, if we want new theological imagination, isn't it a fact that it doesn't spring only from looking at old sources, but rather by looking at how the church today is uh, trying to, te to uh, treat the challenges that it's facing. And, and, and that's maybe where we should look if we want this new um, theological imagination. Thank you. I'm going to take that as a comment and move on to the question in the back. The few people who want to ask questions. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was thinking of the uh, title and the comment that Trinitarian is theological and ontology is, is, is philosophical, is uh, concerned with philosophy, but I'm not sure if that is actually the case, because ontology is not just about created being, but how we ground that being. And therefore, ontology is, is theological before it's philosophical. So. Thank you. I think I have a question right down here, if I could have a mic. Uh, ah, sorry, well, you'll be next then. Yes, yes, you with the mic, yep. Thanks. Uh, my name's Ross, um, and as a pr brief preface, I grew up with the WWJD bracelets, you know, what would Jesus do? So I know that's jading my question a little bit, um, but it uh, historical Jesus stuff has come up a couple times, and I, I don't know that we've done it justice, maybe in the conversation, um, and while it might be a little bit out of scope, um, I don't think you know Schweitzer and everybody completely foreclosed on the question of its relevance. And so um, I guess my question is if Jesus, or if, if we kind of think that Jesus wouldn't have been thinking Trinitarianly, um, what, what relevance does that have to how we, I guess, undertake a new Trinitarian ontology? Because um, I, I think it, while it might seem a little uh, off to the side here, I think it really matters to the people in our respective congregations and could be, could be interesting or fruitful um, conversation. So I wondered if you might speak to that. Okay, the question is, what would Jesus do, David? <laughs> yeah, that's possible. No, I, well, I'll say this. I mean, uh, that, uh, that uh, any, any theology that detaches itself from that fundamental fact, that Christ, the historical Christ, all the evidence tells us, is a, uh, you know, a political agitator, someone who ceaselessly agitating on behalf of the forsaken, the poor, the indebted, uh, uh, the enslaved, the imprisoned, uh, is, is obviously a, a theology that, that if, it, if, I mean, if it actually detaches itself from the person of Christ, not just as a series of moral counsels that are good for self-improvement, but as the, actual, uh, as the actual form of life that alone gives one access to God as revealed in Christ, then of course that theology is dead. And so, and uh, now let me talk to you about uh, traditional Thomism. Uh, so, no, I don't mean that. <laughs> but you do mean, but, but, but I mean, the, the, we, we do know that there are, there are forms of theology in which the historical Christ becomes more and more an abstraction because the, the liberating message of the gospel, say perhaps, is the, uh, the, the sovereign grace of God uh, abounding in the life of the chief of sinners so abounding that the chief of sinners can go on sinning and that we know that Christ's hands were filled with blood that ours might be filled with gold, right? When you see that, you can immediately recognize this as a depraved theology that, that, that it gives us access neither to the historical person of Christ or any, even a Trinitarian grammar worth pursuing. Okay? Yeah, right. Yes, Professor. Yeah, again, back to this uh, question, uh, to what extent philosophy can um, say something about um, the Trinity, even about the Trinitarian ontology. Sure, on one hand, uh, Vittorio Hösler said that um, to some extent the imminent Trinity may be no problem for nobody who believes in God because um, even the Muslims, uh, the Jewish people, believe that there's a, a kind of self-knowledgement uh, uh, self-knowing um, of God, and this, um, or even they can uh, 
tweet, if you want to say that, one article even of Thomas Aquinas where he makes a question, if there is a processio in, in God, and sure, uh, there's some knowledge of God of itself, and this knowledge can be represented in a concept or in a notitia, in, a, in something, of a, in a kind of mirror, if you want to say that. And uh, this is um, philosophically um, possible to come to this conclusion. But then the big question is always why these uh, internal differences in God now uh, are persons. Why, at the end, this uh, is a relation which constitutes a person. I think this is the point then, um, and you need revelation to come to this conclusion. Uh, Albertus the Great was the first who said, well, stop with the philosophy of the Trinity. That's uh, as a theological uh, issue. And maybe even behind that, it's not only the Aristotelian um, idea of a science now, but even perhaps this new sensibility that the person is not um, something which you can deduce from a characteristic, or from an attribute, or something more abstract. That persons are some um, is a reality which is uh, distinct and uh, cannot be um, uh, proved by a philosophical. Um, argument. It's something given, and maybe therefore revelation is uh, important to come to the conclusion that these differences we can find in God, we can perhaps philosophically justify in God, at the end um, are persons. I think this is the, the, the difficult point. If philosophy can come to the mystery of, 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 uh, of the divine personality, or if uh, philosophy only can demonstrate um, the necessity to presume that in God are some differences as the result of God's self-reflection. Um, this would be my question. Um, sure, in, in Anselm of Canterbury, Richard from St. Victor, because they do not have this strict distinction between philosophy and theology, they can um, uh, speak about ratione cesaria, um, doing their philosophy, the, uh, philosophical theology, um, and being convinced that you have a philosophy of the Trinity later on, sure, this becomes more problematic. But I think it, it's right that it became problematic b because of the mystery of the person, the person you cannot deduce, I think. This is the point or the problem. Thank you. I, I don't know if we have really any time. Would anyone like quickly to respond, or perhaps we just must, uh, must end there? Because I think... Um, uh, I want to, I think Ryan wants to say a few words. I want to thank our panel very much. And uh, we have at last come to the conclusion of our conference. We have, as Professor Catherine Pickstock alluded to, momentarily responded to a time of increasing estrangement in the global environment at the heights of power and perhaps even amongst ourselves in this country and around the world. And yet we may, with this conference, also add the seeds of something new. The Trinity can, as this conference has suggested, be recollected as an answer to many of these questions in the church as well as in the academy and in the wider society. For the idea of the Trinity is, as we have seen, the idea of relations, first of the relations among the divine persons within God, then of the relations in humanity to nature, and finally of the relations among all the peoples of the world, even in this very theater. We have with this conference endeavored to show how the question of metaphysics or ontology in analogous imitation of the Trinity can once again be seen to stand at the very center of philosophical theology, as well as all of the other arts and sciences in the secular academy. We have enjoyed a veritable, veritable feast of ideas featuring a range of topics on philosophy, history, literature, politics, ecology, and theology. Such a feast can, as Graham Ward has reminded us, never be identically repeated it can at best only be given again in an accelerating exchange of new gifts in which we give away more than we receive and yet nonetheless gain more than we have given. We may thus hope that this festival may continue ever afterwards amongst all of you in ever richer relations. We could without a doubt not have hosted this conference without your contributions. We have to our astonishment received over 300 delegates from over 20 nations in every inhabited continent. I wish on behalf of my colleagues and the Faculty of Divinity to extend our sincere thanks and gratitude to all of you for making this conference possible. <laughs>
Finally, can I invite a final round of applause for the absolutely extraordinary efforts of Ryan in bringing this unique event about.